Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and today we are speaking with Warwick Fairfax, who through Crucible Leadership guides leaders at every level and position in learning from what he describes as their crucible moments, helping them to move beyond failure and emerge to lead a life rooted in who they are. His journey has opened a door for men and women from all walks of life to live and lead in line with how they are designed, following a personal vision that leads to a life of significance. Through his very public personal failures, he has learned how failures can be leveraged to create fulfillment that goes beyond the bottom line, in work and in life. Warwick has identified through his own story, those of his family and of some of history's greatest leaders, that the path to true significance involves understanding how one is defined, learning the lessons of being refined, discovering and developing a personal vision, and making that vision a reality. The journey will not look alike for any two people, but the destination can be the same for anyone willing to muster the humility, transparency, and faith to take it. Welcome, Warwick Fairfax. How are you? I am very well, Lily, and uh, thanks so much for having me on. We're excited to have you on our podcast. Are you ready to pour into our listeners? Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. So Warwick, can you tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now? So I grew up in Australia in a large family media business that was founded 150 years ago by an ancestor of mine. At its height, it had the equivalent in Australia of the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, as well as TV, radio, magazines. And I was looked upon as the heir apparent. So I launched a big takeover, which will probably come up uh, later. It was about 2.25 billion Australian, which is about a billion five plus US. Wanting to change management and uh, bring it back to the ideals of the founder and went wrong from day one. And three years later, it went under. So that was kind of a big challenge that I went through. So the path to what I'm doing now, which through Crucible Leadership, I'm a leadership advisor. I write on leadership, and in particular, trying to help leaders who've gone through a business failure or been fired. Uh, and more generally than that, crucibles uh, could include anything from a health crisis to marital issues. Uh, obviously, my experience is more in the business world. I do that through sort of a model I've developed, refined design, vision, reality. So first step is you go through a crucible like mine, which is a, an epic failure all over the news in Australia. So how do you bounce back from that? How do you get beyond that? And in my case, what was needed was more of a take charge leader and I'm more of a reflective person, reflective advisor. So first key when you've gone through something is maybe there are keys to how you're wired that you're in the wrong, what you were doing is the wrong fit, which it certainly was for me. And so then you're faced with, okay, well, I've gone through this horrendous experience, might have some idea of how I'm designed, but now what? What's a vision that I care about? A good vision needs to be rooted in your beliefs and values and something that you think should change. Sometimes you've gone through a horrific experience and you don't want anybody else to go through it again. A vision that's really personal to you and get the right team around you and with some perseverance, it might become reality. So that's what I'm doing now, the vision and the model and a little bit of a snapshot about my own evolution mm. through that, if you will. Well, very interesting. Now, I read about Crucible Leadership, and I love that. How did you land on that name for your company? It really grew out of the book. I wrote a book about my experiences. Uh, it's really organized thematically around different themes of leadership, such as vision, perseverance, character, uh, authenticity. And as I also weave in stories from inspirational biblical leaders as well as historical. And as I did that, and I was chatting with some folks who have been helping me with branding and marketing. We were trying to figure out, well, you know, what's the core message of this? And it was really bouncing back from failure, getting beyond it. You know, crucible, one definition is where you heat metals and they, you know, meld together, becomes a different substance, a different alloy, if you will. So with the crucible, 
you're never the same. You really have a choice. And sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes it's not your fault. And you can either kind of wallow in that and kind of hide under the covers. And often that's really understandable. Uh, I mean, heaven forbid there are some people who've gone through abuse and I could totally understand how, you know, it'd be difficult to recover from something like that. But whether it's your fault or not, just saying, okay, this was awful. It sucked, but now what? And so you have a choice, which is, you know, how do I get beyond this? How do I use this to help other people? Hmm. Which in of itself is somewhat healing. So a crucible really, it presents you with a choice. You can either say, I'm giving up. This is awful. It's not fair. Or you can say, well, okay, it was awful. It wasn't fair, but how do we move beyond this? So I had to sort of crucible. Now you mentioned a little bit about your leadership style. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it's interesting. Growing up, what was needed was this take charge, take no prisoners, at least from my perspective. But Mm -hmm. I'm more somebody that likes asking questions and making statements. I'm reserved by nature. So I realized the way I lead, the way I am is as a reflective advisor. So I've done a lot of executive coaching. I'm a certified executive coach for the International Coach Federation. I'm on a couple of nonprofit boards, the non-denominational church I go to, and my kids' school, a private faith-based school. And in those arenas where I'm on a board and I'm giving advice and counsel, that is a perfect fit. I'm really not the upfront take charge leader. I'm somebody that can help that leader through partly through advice, but I find the best way I give advice is actually through questions. Even when I'm on a board, I'm still in coaching mode and often I'll ask a question and I'll say, boy, that's a great point. And I'm thinking, well, what do you mean? I just asked a question, but somehow I must have had a point to my question. So really the moral of that whole story is be who you were designed to be. It's okay if you're not the upfront charismatic leader. We need all kinds of people. You know, the world it's like that whole, it takes a village. That's right. person. It's, it's okay to be you because mm-hmm. being you is the best way to make a contribution to the world. Yes, absolutely. Now, Warwick, which quote or quotes speak to your life and why? You know, I love that question. One that really resonates with me is from Gandhi. And he said, be the change that you want to see in the world. My favorite Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good quotes, but it's hard to get past that. And as obviously, as you know, what I love about Gandhi is he really lived his credo. He was campaigning for independence from India, from Britain. He lived a very humble lifestyle, practiced and preached nonviolence. And he held no title or position. And sadly, he died uh, because of an assassin in 1948. And India's first prime minister, Nehru, called him the father of the nation. And he also said of him more than his words, his life with his message. Mm -hmm. He had no title. He wasn't prime minister, no position. But yet he was the primary factor behind India becoming independent. And all of India loved him. So Mm -hmm. it's really an embodiment and a message to all of us. And in my own very small way, I try and live what I believe about crucible leadership and being authentic and it's not easy to live your message. I write a lot of blogs and social media and I, as I'm reading them, I'm thinking, okay, do I do everything I'm advocating? And <laughs> no, truth be told, I try, but right. I'm not at a hundred percent. That's why it was so effective. He lived his message. Yeah. That's one of my favorite quotes and it's challenging us to walk the talk. And if you have that vision, then we need to be that change. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Now, as a reflective advisor, What's the best advice you've ever received? That is challenging because good advice is not easy. I mean, I've had people try to tell me what to do Mm -hmm. at various times in my life, which I found very unhelpful. So to me, a better way of advising is asking somebody good questions. So in my arena of vision, you know, what's a vision that you're passionate about? How does that tie to who you are? And the way I approach it, it's got nothing to do with me telling somebody what to do. It's helping them get in touch with what they want to do and who they want to be. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's about. And so I wished back when I was doing my takeover late 1987 and age 26, I wish somebody had asked me, are you doing this to fulfill your vision or is it to make your parents happy? Do you cut out for this position? To what degree does this all match up? But truth be told, even if somebody asked me all the questions I wish somebody had, 
I was young, idealistic, and stubborn, and there's a pretty good chance I wouldn't listen. <laughs> Sometimes right. you've got to go through a few roadblocks and crashes in life before you're going to listen. So true for many of us. Often we get good advice by around role models and how they've lived their lives. I think of my dad back in 1976 when I was 15, he was chairman of the family media company. He was thrown off as chairman by some very close family members. And at the time, I felt that was so wrong. It was devastating to him. It was devastating to me. But I remember he said, while I think this is wrong, I'm going to forgive them because from his perspective, that's what God wants us to do is, is to forgive. Mm -hmm. and I wouldn't say he did it perfectly, but just that example of no matter what happens, we are called to forgive. Yes, there was advice in there, but the way he lived his life was his advice. And I've never forgotten that and to the degree possible tried to live it. I know that I tend to take advice from people that walk the talk. It's the example that people set that makes a difference. Right, because if you, somebody's giving you advice and they're not living it, right. it why should I listen to you? I mean, That's you have right. no credibility. No us. credibility. So Warwick, what does it mean to you to have a good team and how do you build and sustain one? Well, the key to implementing vision is to create a team. And for many leaders, especially visionary leaders, it's so tough. The image I think of is Michelangelo's statue of David. Imagine for many leaders, we think our vision is kind of like that. It sounds a bit arrogant, but visionaries are in love with their vision to a degree. And what you have to do is give the hammer and chisel to your team and say, okay, I'd love your contribution. And from my way of thinking, if it's 80% of your vision and it gets 100% buy-in, isn't it better than 100% of your vision and zero buy-in? I mean, 80% is not bad, you know? That is a win for most people. So you've got to be willing to say to your team, here's a draft, but I'd love your input and be serious about it and try to include at least some of their suggestions. When you do that, that is certainly one way to get enormous buy-in. So really, the key to implementing vision is you've got to be able to have a team that obviously varying skills. To, you know, if I'm a reflective advisor, you don't need 10 reflective advisors around me. One or two are okay, but maybe some implementers would be helpful. At least yes. Like. <laughs> Otherwise, you sit down and get nothing done. But right. think. Now, now, for most leaders, <laughs> they tend to be, you know, action men or action women and just, you know, put it all in place, you know, have all these ideas, let's go, let's not even think. Or maybe you can be able to say, hang on a second, let's think about this. You know, mm -hmm. how, what's this going to mean to the shareholders, to stakeholders, to employees, customers? Let's just hold on a second and think. So mm -hmm. diversity of skills, diversity, obviously, in general, is extremely helpful in a team. But the key is you've got to be willing to give them input. One of the best examples I know in history, and I love history, is Abraham Lincoln. He had a team that originally thought he was an idiot, this country bumpkin from Illinois, which is back then was thought of as out west. And they had no respect for him. They were far better educated and better pedigree, if you will. But in Lincoln's second inaugural address, where he talks about with malice towards none and charity to all, one of the greatest statements in American history or beyond, he actually said to his cabinet, I've written this draft, I'd love your input. Can you imagine giving input? to that. I don't think we'll ever know the details of exactly how that happened, but he really lived that concept. It was no wonder that his team was so united behind him. But that's really what it takes. Right. And the team that he selected were people that were politically against him. Exactly. Yes. They were his rivals for the Republican right. nomination. They all believed the wrong man had been selected. Right. How could this guy be president when we're far more qualified? They were you know, governors and senators. He was not. I can understand if, if most of us were them, they'd say, well, clearly the wrong person's been selected. Right. So Warwick, you've spoken about a challenge early on. Is there anything else you'd like to share about how it's shaped your life? I'd say the biggest challenge for me was getting beyond the fall of Fairfax Media. I mean, it was years. Most of the 90s were wilderness years for me. It was very difficult because here was this family media business been in my family for 150 years, founded by a person of faith. Faith is important to me. So I'm feeling like surely this is my mission in life. A media company can have a huge role in shaping the country, in keeping politicians honest, what have you. I mean, it's not just the making widgets. 
and I'd gone, did my undergrad at Oxford, like my father and some other relatives worked in banking at Wall Street, went to Harvard Business School. I mean, I'm preparing my whole life for this. And then when it went, well, now what? Wow. And now what do I do in life? Who am I? What's my vision? It was a very Solar. public failure. Absolutely. I mean, it was, it was epic. You mm. know, if you uh, Google me, it's, uh, you know, I have a small Wikipedia uh, entry. It's not favorable and it may never be favorable. I mean, nobody likes that. Um, mm -hmm. There were editorial cartoons done on me. And trust me, you don't want an editorial cartoon done about you. It's never mm -hmm. flattering. You know, sort of young, hot kid could have had it all and blew it. So mm -hmm. uh, probably the final challenge was being a person of faith. I felt like God had this plan to maybe use me and I blew it. So I kind of let God down. It sounds a bit stupid. And my theological reasoning was a little faulty. You know, if he'd wanted it to happen, it would have. But on so many levels, I was feeling pretty bad about myself. So the challenge was now what? And frankly, a, a key back was my faith, this notion that we're all children of God. God loves us all. We all have a unique purpose, be it big or small. And it's more about who we are. He doesn't really need our achievements. It's more just being who you are. It's not trying to accomplish some big thing. Mm -hmm. So that sense, we all have unique value. It's not about how much material success or whatever we have. That certainly was a key, but gradually over time, discovering who I was, I worked in a aviation services company doing financial and business analysis. From there, heard about executive coaching, found that was a great fit for me, got on a couple of nonprofit boards, started writing my book about crystal leadership, have been more recently active on social media, blogging, so all of that was a, a gradual journey, which my self-respect, almost brick by brick, started increasing. I began to think maybe there's things I can do without screwing up. So my self-esteem was at rock bottom. You know, one low point was when I was working in this aviation services company. You know, I was working hard, doing a good job. But I was thinking I must be one of the lowest paid Harvard Business School graduates ever. And I'm not motivated by money at all. But it was just the sense of, gosh, you know, what's happened? So mm -hmm. the road back was tough, but I'm in a great place now. I feel exactly that I'm being who I'm meant to be and I'm trying to make mm -hmm. a contribution to others. But yeah, the road back from that kind of devastating failure is, it just doesn't happen overnight, at least not for me. Hey, leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. If you haven't downloaded your copy of the Master Leadership Journal, go to masterleadership.org forward slash MLJ to get instant access and begin growing your leadership with questions that have been curated by top level leaders. I've also included some cool extras for you at masterleadership.org forward slash MLJ. Well, you know, I really appreciate just your transparency, your authenticity about sharing that because that's not easy. I mean, I had to shut down my business. It certainly wasn't something on the scale that you had, but it feels horrible. And I can see how crucible and crucible leadership is exactly where you need to be because you've lived it. Exactly. It's not the size of the failure. You know, one of the instrumental pivotal points in my life was about 10 years ago, pastor of my church asked me to give a few minute talk about my story that somehow was going to be an illustration for his sermon. I'm thinking, okay, you know, whatever, happy to do it. And as I'm speaking, what was interesting to me is there weren't any failed media moguls in the audience. It was just a cross section of society. But somehow by talking about failure in an authentic and vulnerable way, and obviously it's a church, so obviously there's a paid aspect to it. That's when I began to see that as we're being able to be transparent about our failures, it gives other people the freedom to say, well, you know, I failed too. And that doesn't mean I'm a bad person. Maybe I made some poor judgments or maybe it wasn't my fault at all. It's okay. Too many leaders are afraid to talk about failure. I mean, how many people write books about that? It's, you know, follow me. You know, I was CEO of X Corporation and I'm successful, so do what I did. And a lot of people write about that, but it's hard to be alive without going through some kind of tragedy or some kind of failure. It's almost impossible. So yeah. how do you get beyond failure and tragedy? You know? I know that in your work, you value significance over success. 
or you focus more on significance. And most people who have done significant things or who live a significant life have gone through really tough things. You know, I think that is so profoundly true. I mean, I love leadership. And when I think of some of the great leaders, uh, there's so many examples, but one obvious one is Franklin Roosevelt, who in the 20s suffered from polio, which back then, it was a, a huge social stigma. If you had polio, you were told to stay at home. Just don't go out in public. It's almost like being a leper. Right. Terrible how people were treated back then. And so here's this fellow that grew up in a wealthy, aristocratic background in New York, fun-loving, life-of-the-party fellow. I mean, the last person you would think you would pick to lead America out of the Depression. I mean, how could you identify with somebody like that? But Mm. somehow polio and the road back, it changed him. It gave him an empathy for common men and women, the average person that he didn't have before. I mean, he wouldn't have been who he was without the tragedy that he went through, it it made the man that he was. So that's a great example of how his crucible, it fundamentally changed him, made him the the great leader that he was. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, can you tell us about one of your greatest successes? You know, when I think about success, it's really, it's being able to get beyond what I went through with the aftermath of the takeover and lead a life of significance. I'm not against money and success, but it's really trying to help other people, uh, trying to make the world a better place, if you will. So gradually getting to the point where I'm trying to lead a life that's in harmony with my innate wiring, I feel like I now have some respect, which I think that's important for all of us. I have to confess it's important to me, (laughs) given what I went through with being respected, I actually value pretty highly uh, because Mm -hmm. I've gone through years where I, I wasn't. You know, right. great, you have a Harvard MBA and Oxford degree, but look what you did. You know, mm-hmm. what did mm-hmm. that get you? You know, not, not too far. So the fact just in my writing, the book, I'm in the process of getting uh, published to nonprofit boards, coaching, I feel like I'm the, exactly who I was designed to be and having a significant contribution. It's not on the scale that some people might think, well, how can you call that a success? You could have been in charge of a big media company and helped influence a nation. You know, if we had a whole bunch of people leading lives of significance, that adds up to a world-changing difference. One life that's changed is a big deal. So I think we can get caught up in numbers when it comes to significance. So I feel like in my own way, I am making a difference. May not be on a world uh, shattering scale, but- Well, you know what? It's not over yet. (laughs) So Warwick, where can our listeners connect with you? My website is a good place to go. That would be crucibleleadership.com. I'm active on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn. You can subscribe to my blog. The other way that you could learn more about crucible leadership and the model I've been talking about, refined design and vision reality, is there's a workbook on the front page of the website which you can download and begin to try to figure out, well, what does this mean for me? That'd be a good place, crucibleleadership.com, where there's a number of resources that they can learn more about. Perfect. Thank you. Now, many leaders describe themselves as lifelong learners. What does that mean to you? And what are you learning now? You know, for me, I think we always need to grow. Um, You know, while I have my own model of crucible leadership and leading a life of significance, it's not wanting to settle, you know, wanting to go for more. I value humility by putting your gifts under a bushel and feeling like, okay, who am I to succeed? That whole philosophy by Marianne Williamson, a lot of great thinking about this. And um, you might say, who am I to do this? She would say, well, who am I not? The world needs people who want to dream. So I try to live that way. Authenticity and humility is a huge deal for me, but with crucible leadership, what I write about, I continue to try to expand it, to talk about different things. Originally, I read a lot about organizational leadership, but more recently, I've been talking about forgiveness. How do you forgive yourself, which is a, mm-hmm. a big deal for me. That's one of the things I've tried to learn over the years for what I did. Somebody by nature, if, if there's a problem in the world, I assume it's my fault. I'm a bit like that. Mm-hmm. So forgiving myself is really mm-hmm. tough. And then how do, you've got to forgive others. They typically could care less if they've done something bad to you. They don't care. 
usually, but the reason you, it's helpful to forgive others is because you deserve it. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. how do we live on with resentment? So mm -hmm. I try to continually live what I preach, if you will, about crucible leadership. I love reading about history and other leaders. So uh, we always have to keep learning about others and about ourselves. Uh, there's always things about ourselves that we don't like, or maybe comes up out of relationships with our loved ones. And gosh, I need to improve in this area. But just about intellectual learning. It's about relational learning of who we are. Right. So right. It's a big question. But, uh, Great. Thank you. Now, here's another big question. <laughs> if there were something you could change in education, what would that be? Well, I'm on the board of my kids' school, which is a, a faith-based school. And what I don't like about education is it's very didactic. You just uh, have a teacher up there. And in high school, they will do a lot of lecturing. And maybe you fill out notes and workbooks. And yes, there's a place for lecturing. But there's not enough discussion. I know one of the things that I valued at Oxford was the whole educational system is based on the tutorial. So typically you would have one professor to two students, and I did politics, philosophy, and economics. So certainly in that kind of area, if you're writing something about political philosophy or some political system somewhere, you would read out your essay, you would then discuss it, and your professor would ask you these mind-numbingly tough questions. And because they're very smart and they're experts in their field, obviously that makes the questions very good. So to me, if there was more discussion, you want to train young people to have opinions, but be able to dialogue, debate, learn from each other. I realize that requires a very talented teacher. It's more difficult to be able to lead a discussion than it is just to read lecture notes, but we want our teachers not just to know stuff, but to be able to conduct as an orchestra, if you will, being able to orchestrate a discussion. That, to me, would revolutionize education if we did more of that. That sounds like a lot of fun, too. I think so. I think yeah. the right kind of teacher would love doing that. All right. Thank you so much for that. Now, you have a lot of responsibilities. What do you do on a daily basis to set your mind? Well, I think it partly depends on the framework you come from. For me, as a person of faith, Mm -hmm. I try to do daily scripture reading and reflection. There's nothing wrong with doing it intellectually, but I think it's far better if you read it and try to understand what those scriptures mean and how do you apply it to your life? You know, what does it mean to be humble? What is self-sacrifice? I mean, what does it mean by putting others before self? I mean, there's a lot of broader principles and scriptures. So the way I get centered and, and calm is I meditate over those, sometimes scripture memory, but I would say more broadly, find some truth that could be in a religious tradition. It could be from a philosophical way of thought. Find something you believe in that's who you are and just read it, meditate on it, and think, okay, what can I do today that would keep my life in harmony with that which I believe? It's a very useful thing to do. Thank you so much for that. Now, if you were to go back in time, what advice would you give the younger you? about leadership? I would say leadership comes in many forms. We often think of the leader as having to be an upfront, charismatic, maybe take no prisoners kind of leader like we see on TV or in politics or a lot of examples of bad leaders. But I would say you don't have to be like that. It's okay to be introverted. You always tend to think of great leaders being extroverted, which is not true. There's plenty of good leaders that are introverted. Be who you are. Find your own leadership voice. It doesn't have to be like everybody else's. So in my case, being a reflective advisor means you don't necessarily look for the upfront role. That's not you. And that's okay. You can have influence in your own way by writing, by being an advisor on boards or community groups. Find your niche that matches who you are. Again, I don't know if I would have listened, but... Um, <laughs> You know, because I was so bound up with pleasing my parents and right. the family dynasty and the legacy. I mean, it would have been tough. But mm. hopefully there are other young people that aren't as stubborn as I was and might be more open. That's why I have this question in here. All right. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? I would say, especially for younger folks, be who you are. I'm not against respecting parents, don't get me wrong, but... It used to be in a former era, uh, you can do anything you want to, so long as it's a doctor, lawyer, 
that kind of thing. And there's nothing wrong with being in those professions, but be who you are, find your own vision, find your own path. It's not about what other people tell you you should do and be, be who you want to be, follow your own path. That way leads to greater happiness, greater fulfillment, and ultimately greater significance. If you're trying to accomplish something and it's not your vision, it's not grounded in your own inherent values and beliefs, the chances of success is very minimal. So mm -hmm. be who you are, follow your own calling. Advice is good, but ultimately nobody can really tell you what your calling is other than you. And you know why this speaks to me so much, Warwick, is that you're not just giving this advice. You actually lived it. You had decided at one time to do what other people told you you should do. And you saw and you felt the results of that. The way you faced it, you don't have to come back. You can keep hiding. The right. fact that you're out and about says a lot about your faith. And it says a lot about the kind of person and man you are. You were able to also create this crucible leadership path. So I want to commend you for that. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, for adding value to me and to our listeners. Well, thank you, Lee, for having me on. And thank you for the work that you're doing with leadership. It's a great discussion about what leadership is. It's a great mission. So thank you for what you're doing. All right. Well, have a great evening. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, leaders. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.